You open your eyes and see a light once hidden behind darkness and shadows. You see a peace in the serenity and the calm. I see a training for the trial, the enabling of God. You see a storm, waves of suffocating sorrow which threaten to smother you. I see an anchor, a hope. You see mistakes and failures, baggage and pain. I see influence, a microphone. One day you'll open your eyes and see potentials expired, and time is up. But I see the echoes in eternity, a work finally finished. Listen, focus. A light lies hidden beneath the darkness of shadows. See the things unseen. Eternity now, through the eyes of a lion. I'm excited to be bringing the word. Uh, my mom and my dad, pastors Dwayne and Chris, they are in Miwok, California. And so, did we just get a whoop whoop from Miwok? Because I'd never heard of that place before. Or the California, okay. It's Cal yeah, I'm sure we've all been to Miwok before, but... Uh, they, they send their love and uh, they'll be back next week as we're starting a new series called Ask Big. And uh, you got to be careful the, the order you put that in. You don't want to say big ask. Um, <laughs> I had to make the joke. Uh, so yeah, so next week, next week they'll be back starting a new series. But uh, I'm excited for all God wants to do today in this place. And we've been uh, in this series called through the eyes of a lion. And so I get to close us out this morning and with uh, part four, part four. And so uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but we actually have uh, a lion in our family. We have a lion in our family. Um, his name is Zion and we call him Zion the lion. <laughs> Look at that. Oh my, I need just a big corporate Oh, like that is the cutest. That's my nephew. No, I love him. We call him Zion the Lion. And my mom made up a little song and, and she, she sings to him, Zion the Lion. And, and I can't wait for the day where I begin to teach Zion stuff. Because uh, whenever, first of all, me and him are going to get in a lot of trouble, okay? <laughs> and uh, a lot of trouble. And now I'm going to send him back with mom. And uh and so but I can't wait till we get to teach them stuff because as kids, uh, whenever, whenever that we have kids, I don't, I don't know why we do this, but we love as we're teaching them things, one of the things that we teach them are animal noises, right? And, and uh, come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. We, we teach them animal noises. So you have a little kid, I can't wait to teach Zion animal noises. I'm so excited. And uh, we'll teach them stuff like the cow goes, Man, y'all are the smart class. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. The cow goes. The duck goes. And the lion goes. Come on, I need everybody to participate this morning. Come on, I need everybody. I need everybody to participate this morning. So the cow goes. The duck goes. And the lion goes. No, that's how a lion goes. Some of y'all are like, lion goes rawr. Like, no, this is what a lion sounds like. Come on, hit us one more time. That's what a lion sounds like. And we can't talk about lions and not talk about roars. Because one of the coolest things that a lion does, one of the, its attributes is its roar. So this morning we're going to be talking about a lion's roar and the title of my message is Run Towards the Roar. Run Towards the Roar. So we're going to be looking to start off in Luke 24. And in Luke 24, uh, we're going to be starting in verse 13. Verse 13, Luke 24, verse 13. Uh, Y'all ready to eat a little bit? Is it okay if we, if we eat a little bit? Y'all didn't have breakfast, so we're going to eat some scrolls this morning. It's our daily bread. And uh, even if you don't eat gluten, you can eat this bread. It'll be good for you. Verse 13. If you got it, say got it. If you're going to wait for it to come up on the screen, don't say nothing. Okay. Verse 13. Verse 13, it says this. Uh, now the same day 
Two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? I can imagine these guys are like, why are you so nosy, bro? Like, <laughs> who are you coming up in our conversation? And uh, what are you discussing? And they stood still. Their faces were downcast. One of them named Cleopas, and I'm going to call him Cleo, asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem? And do, not, do you not know the things that have happened there in these days? Have you been living under a rock? Have you been off of Facebook? Have you, have you not been watching TV? Because everybody knows all of what's happened. And, and, and Jesus, uh, they don't know it's Jesus, but Jesus says, what things? About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He, he was a prophet. Powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they did not find his body. That's good news right there. They did not find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions, they went to the tomb and they found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Okay, pause. This is really cool. This is Jesus, the word, the word made flesh. This is the word talking about the word. They don't know it's Jesus, but Jesus made flesh. The word is talking about the word. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. I love this. Jesus is tricking them. Jesus was acting like he was going further. He's like, okay, guys, I'm going to keep on going uh, this way, and, uh, and uh, I'll see you guys later, all right? Good talking to you about the scriptures and the word and stuff. And uh, It's kind of creepy. Like, I don't know why I think Jesus is doing this, but... <laughs> Uh, he said, I'm going to go this way. And they said, no, 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 no. Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we talked with uh, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem their hearts were burning and as soon as their eyes were opened they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem there they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying it is true the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Woo, yeah, that's a good time to say amen. That's good news right there. So Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for everything that you want to do in this place. I thank you that we would not leave the same way that we came in. And I thank you, Lord, that you would just help me articulate everything that you want said this morning. I thank you for my family. I thank you for the bridge and everything that you have done, that you are doing, and that you're going to do. Father, I also pray for my cowboys, that they would sign Ezekiel Elliott, because he said, no, I rebuke that. As the season starts, be with them, because we need it. It's in your name we pray, amen and amen. Come on, church, put your hands together if you're excited to be in the house. Yes, yes. Well, uh, 
If you know me at all, and, and through this series, I, I preached at the beginning of it, and I, I, you know that I absolutely love lions, and I watch, pro, I've probably watched too many lion documentaries. Um, there's a lot, I could be like reading my Bible and stuff, but I like watching lion documentaries because I'm a nerd. And, um, and so I, one of the cool things that I like watching, and, and I don't know if you've ever seen this, but uh, if you, if you get scared easily or if you get grossed out easily, I would recommend not to do this. But uh, has anybody in here ever seen footage of lions hunting? Have you ever seen it? Yes, it is so cool. And so one of my favorite things is to watch lions hunt. It's just this really cool thing. And so I'm fascinated by, by them. And, and through some documentaries, I've learned some interesting things about them. And um, compared to other creatures, the way that they hunt is actually relatively slow. Like they're in it for the long haul. And, um, and they can't change direction uh, that well compared to a lot of their prey. And they don't really use wind to their advantage. But there are two things that lions do that help them uh, considerably. And uh, first, one of the things that lions do when they hunt is they are actually uh, incredibly good at hiding. And they, uh, they are phenomenally patient. Like they are patient creatures. And so, uh, so one thing that they do, and you see the footage of the, the tall savanna grass and you see like, you know, their bones in their back, like they're like prowling, you know, they're just, they're just crawling through and they hide really easy. And, they, and, they, and so one of the things they do is they hide and they're very patient. But uh, another one is that, that they are the only social cat, meaning they hang out and they hunt in what we would call a pride. Come on, y'all know this, right? Y'all have heard of the pride. And so a pride is a group of lions, and lions, they don't hunt on their own. They hunt in a pride. And so uh, this, is, this is why they are better than any other cat, because your house cat that you got at, at home, it's, uh, it's independent, and it's not like dogs, because, uh, come on, I'm a dog person, not a cat person. But cats, like, I hate, I hate cats. I, I think that I had a moment when I was a child, I have a scar on my nose, because I... Uh, I got attacked by a cat and it was very traumatic. I pulled its tail, but it, um, <laughs> but it was, it was traumatic nonetheless. But, uh, you know, cats, like, you, you know, your house cat, you try to like pet a cat and it's like, no, get away from me. <laughs> like, I don't like you. Until you decide that you don't like cats, then they want to get up all on you. And it, it, it's like, they do their own thing. But lions, they're social cats and they like to hang out with each other and they hunt together. And one of the cool things that when they hunt, uh, they, have, they have great tactics to, uh, to, to get their prey and, um, and it helps them to hunt their prey because they work together. These lions, they work together. And uh, usually when they attack, one, uh, one or more, like a couple of lions or just a singular lion, will get in front of the prey. And what it will do is it will roar as loud as it can. And a lion's roar can actually travel up to five miles. Like that's crazy, five miles of roar. And so it'll get in front of the, it'll get in front of the, uh, in front of the animal and it'll roar as loud as it can. And this will usually be an older lion, one of the more mature lions. And, um, and because what, what it will do is it will roar knowing that when it's prey, hears the roar of a lion, it will run the opposite direction. Okay, if I'm out in the wilderness and I hear a lion's roar, I don't know why, I, it's not like I could outrun a lion, but I'm gonna try, okay? Like I'm gonna run the opposite direction. But lions, they know this, and, and so what they do is one lion will roar, but the other one will actually be on the other side. They will flank it, they will be behind the prey so that when it roars the opposite direction, when it runs the opposite direction of the roar, then they can trap it and, that's, it, and it, it runs right into their trap. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing how, how they work. So a, 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 an older lion will roar, and then the prey will run. That little impala, you know, it's by the watering hole. It'll, like, freak out. Okay, that's a lion. I don't need to go that way. So it'll run, and it actually runs right into the trap of the enemy. Right into the trap of the enemy. And this is counterintuitive because you would think that the safest thing to do would be to run away from the roar. When in fact, the safest thing for that impala to, to do would actually be to run towards the roar, to run right at it. But oftentimes, we don't want to run at the roar, we run away from the roar, 
And the Bible says that uh, the, the, the enemy is like a roaring lion. And what happens is when the enemy roars at us, oftentimes we want to run away from the roar instead of running right at it. Falling into the trap that he set up for us. It's, a, it's the same with life. It, and, and we just read this famous and this phenomenal story of two disciples. You know, you got Cleo. You got Cleo and then the other one, he's unnamed. When I get to heaven, if I was this other disciple, I'd say, Jesus, how come you put Cleo's name in there and not mine? Okay, why, am, why does my name not get in there? But Cleo and then the unnamed guy was there, the other disciple. And uh, they, they, they are they are walking away and they're on their way and they're frightened, they're scared, they are, uh, they are, they, they are sad. Uh, verse 31, it says, uh, it, 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 they're on their way, but then verse 31, it says, then their eyes were opened. Then their eyes were opened. Once this happened, once their eyes were opened, they ended up running toward what they were previously heading away from. We see a live picture of this right here, of running towards the roar instead of running away. They were running away. They were going away from Jerusalem, but then their eyes were opened. And once their eyes were opened, then they went back to Jerusalem. They ran towards the roar. They stopped, uh, they stopped fleeing and started pursuing. And they're going back to Jerusalem where they could be arrested, where they could be imprisoned, where they could be beaten for being followers of Jesus. This is where they have traumatic memories, okay? In this place, that would, that it, no, you know that on their way back to Jerusalem, they were having these flashbacks because this was the last place that they saw Jesus. This was the place where they, they saw him whipped. Come on, somebody. This is the place where they had lost hope. This is, this is where Skull Hill is, where they, they saw him die. This is the garden tomb which represented the death of all of their dreams. But their eyes were opened and they decided to run towards the roar. Verse 17, it says, before, before their eyes were opened, it said, verse, uh, verse 17, it tells us that their faces were downcast. Their faces were downcast, meaning they're sad. That they, they're walking away, they're sad because dis, uh, disappointment, you can, you can see the disappointment and when you, as you're reading it, the disappointment is evident in their sad words. Verse 19, it says things like, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. Verse 21, it says, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Okay, catch this picture. Jesus is there, they don't know it's Jesus. Why are you boys sad? We had hoped that Jesus was going to do something, but he didn't do it. They're talking to Jesus and he is right in front of them and they're telling Jesus how he had failed them not knowing that it was Jesus. We had hoped. We had ho I wonder if there's anybody in here that has ever hoped in something and it seemed like what they had hoped in failed. You, you, God gave you a promise and it seems like that promise is dead. And we do the same thing that the disciples were doing, and we talk to God all about how God has failed while they're in the middle of the story living out the promise coming to pass. Y'all see, do you catch it? I don't ever want to find myself in a place where I'm complaining to God about everything that he's not. And he's just saying, I wish you would open your eyes. If you could just open your eyes and see that I am a redeemer, that I can restore the situation, that I can mend those relationships, that I will do what I promised you, son. I pro uh, I, if you could just open your eyes 
and run towards the roar instead of falling right into the trap of the enemy. Jesus is there is like, yeah, tell me more about myself. Yeah, tell me more about everything that I'm not. Because your eyes are about to get open. And when your eyes are open, you're going to feel real stupid. That was him the whole time. That's why my heart was burning while he was talking. Because it was him. And I thought he had failed. But actually, I'm a part of the promise coming to pass. I want to tell somebody in here this morning that it might look like it failed, that you might have lost hope, but if you can just stick it out, if you can run towards the roar, maybe you can be a part of the story. Maybe actually God wants to show you that the promise is coming to pass. It just doesn't look like what you thought it would look like. The Bible says that he's the potter and I'm the clay. Who's the clay to tell the potter how to do it? I never want to get to a place in my life where I am telling God that he'd fail me and he's saying, if you could just open your eyes, Cody, and see that I'm actually working it out, that I'm actually here, that I'm actually everything that you read about me, that I'm actually ever, I promise you, I promise you, I, I promise you, and I, and, I, and, I, and I don't lie. And so, and so it's evident, it's evident, it's evident. That, that they were sad and that we had hoped, we had hoped, we had hoped. The, the past tense is unmistakable. Uh, life did not turn out like they thought it would. In, in ways small and in ways large, we can relate as well. The irony is that they're saying all of this about Jesus to Jesus. And, and, and they're mourning over something that they thought was over. Catch this. We should never mourn... Anytime we mourn over something, anytime we mourn over something that we think is over, when Jesus is in it, our mourning is premature. Catch this. Anytime we mourn over something that you think is over, anytime you mourn over something that you think is over, is always premature when Jesus is in it. Hold on, did y'all hear what I said? Your mourning is always premature when Jesus is in the situation. And you might not can see Jesus in the situation, but just like the disciples, just because you can't see Jesus in the situation doesn't mean that he's not there. So you're, uh, don't allow your mourning to be premature. I, I don't want to mourn prematurely because Jesus always gets the last word. And he can make a way when there seems like there is no way. And, and the resurrection is proof of this. That they thought he was dead for three days. And there was silence on Saturday. But when the women came, they saw that the tomb was rolled away. And hear me, that anytime you mourn when Jesus is in it, your mourning is premature. Because he can bring beauty out of ashes. He can turn trash into triumph. And he can, restore to, uh, he can restore to you the things that, were, that you thought were lost forever. He can do more with what's left than you ever could do with, 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 uh, on your own. He, he can do more with the leftovers than, than what you could do on your own. And he can restore to you the things that you, you assumed were gone forever. And graves don't intimidate Jesus. Graves don't intimidate Jesus. Death can't stop them. And once they saw this, once they saw through the eyes of a lion, their pain was turned into power. Their pain was turned into power. They told Jesus not to travel because it was too late, verse 29. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. It, it, it was dangerous to go a few miles in the dark to the next town. We have to look at it culturally. It was dangerous to go in the dark. They didn't have street lamps, right? And so it's, it's dangerous, like it's dark. But once they saw that Jesus was alive, verse 33 tells us that they got up and they returned to Jerusalem at once. You catch it. They were going one way. 
Verse 33, they got up and they returned to once to Jerusalem. It tells us at the beginning of the story that they had a seven-mile journey. They walked seven miles in the dark once they saw that Jesus was in the situation. If we can get our eyes open, if we can open our eyes to the reality that Jesus is in the situation, then we'll be able to travel in the night towards the roar instead of falling into the trap of the enemy. We can, we can run towards the roar. We can run towards it. What's the moral of the story? When your eyes are open, you'll have the courage to do what you didn't think could be done. When your eyes are open, you'll have courage that you didn't have before. So we're going to be looking at how we run uh, towards the roar. And, and, and we're going to look at four essentials to keep in mind as, you seek, uh, as we seek to, to live this out. So, so I'm going to go fast. Number one is reverse of fear. Reverse of fear. Uh, often the thing that we need to do and places that we need to go is exactly the opposite of what fear wants us to do. Okay? Often the thing that we need to do or the places that we need to go is the exact opposite of what fear is trying to get us to do. We tend to bolt when we get frightened. We're like that Impala that's by the water hole and the enemy starts roaring things at us. We get fearful and the thing that we need to do is to run towards the roar but because we're fearful, we do what fear tells us to do, and we run away from it, and then we get trapped. And then we get trapped. See, victory comes from facing fears and running towards what we are frightened of. Victory comes from when we face our fears and we're running towards the roar instead of what we're frightened from. But Trying to run from danger. Yeah, see, we, we, we bolt when we get frightened. And, and trying to run from danger, we often run away from our destiny. We end up running away from our destiny because we're scared of the danger. This is all over scripture. This is all over scripture. Crack open your, your Bible and you'll find tons of stories of this. Like Esther going into the king's presence uninvited. She went towards the fear. Instead of away from it. Mary, accepting the call of God on her life to wake up as an unwed single mother knowing that her fiancé is now in trouble too. <laughs> like that's scary. An angel, an angel comes, what does he say? Do not be afraid. That's scary, but she decided to run towards the roar instead of running away from her fears. And I believe that if Mary didn't do it, I believe that Mary had the power to say no. And if she wouldn't have done it, somebody else would have done it. It's the same with the call of God on our life. If you don't do it, God will do it through somebody. Because he's God. And his purpose and his plans are going to come to pass. But I want him to do it through me. I don't want him to have to do it through somebody else. It's the same with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They ran towards the roar. You know the story, the 90-foot golden statue. And the king said, if you don't bow, you're going to get thrown into a fiery furnace. That's a bad day, y'all. I don't know about y'all, but I've never been threatened to, I've never had the threat of being thrown into a fiery furnace before. Now, I thought my, my dad might do it, but <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't know that it was like, like that wasn't a real threat. They, a fiery furnace that they don't. And they said this. They said, our God can save us. Our God will save us. But even if he doesn't, we still won't bow down. What is that? I'm going to run towards the roar. I'm not going to bow down to what the enemy wants me to bow down to. And I realize that I have... This power, 
and that Jesus, uh, Jesus literally met them in the middle of their situation. It, the king said, when they got thrown into the fire, I see four men. I thought I threw in three, but I see four. And the fourth looks like the son of God. Meaning that whenever you get into the hottest, most difficult place in your life, Jesus will be right there in the middle of it. And I want to run towards the roar. I don't want to slink back into what the enemy's trying to trap me into. I want to run towards it. Somebody say, I'm going to run towards it. Oh, say it like you mean it. Say, I'm going to run towards it. See, David, David is the same. David, David didn't just face Goliath. He ran towards his giant. He ran, he ran, he ran at, at Goliath. And if any of these or many others can do it, let me tell you, you can do it too. You can do it too. It's not just stories of old. God wants to do it now. God wants to do it through you. Uh, the truth is God often calls us to go places that frighten us. So we will tr uh, truly uh, or fully trust him. And, and we, have to, we have to use our, our fear as a diagnostic tool saying, if I'm scared uh, of what God is calling me to do it, maybe he's really calling me to do it. Because if it just came easy, I, I, I don't know if God ever really calls us to easy. There's a grace that we can grab, but I don't know if he's ever like, yeah, the easy way is not always the best way. I know this because, like, the easy thing to do is to eat a bunch of food at home and watch Netflix. But the hard way is going to the gym. <laughs> it's harder to go to the gym than to just, but the easy way is not always the best way. And we can use our fear as a diagnostic. And maybe I'm scared of what God's calling me to do because God's calling me to do it. And the enemy doesn't want me to do it. So he's using fear as a tactic to try to get me to run. So, so we, we, we see, we have to reverse, we, we have to uh, do the reverse of fear. And then number two, we have to do old things in a new way. Old things in a new way. Now, now catch what I'm saying. Uh, I, reverse of fear, oftentimes fear will be the thing uh, that, that you're called to, to do. But we can't use this as an excuse to just kind of do what we want to do. See, uh, th this won't always mean running off and, and taking on a new venture, okay? Uh, th th this won't always be, see, running towards the roar also means doing old things in a new way. Sometimes the roar we need to run to is often remaining in the same place, standing firm. See, I I've, I've been in church my whole life, my, like my whole life, my whole life, okay? And, uh. And, 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 and I've been, you know, I've been here at the bridge, like, since before y'all were here at the bridge, because I had to. And uh, so this is, like, this is, this is nobody that's ever gone to the bridge. This is, like, just other Christians. Sometimes, sometimes other Christians, what we'll do is we'll use, uh, we'll, 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 we'll mask flakiness in the mask of faith. There's nobody here, but like, just like, like I've discovered that oftentimes uh, what we do is uh, we, we, I've discovered we masquerade uh, faith in what it really is, is flakiness. Because it's easier sometimes to run away and to not stand firm. Sometimes running towards the roar actually means standing firm. What you say, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Uh, like, you know, you know that person that has been to 47 different churches? in the past four months, and at every new church that they go to, they tell you what was wrong with the old church. Uh -huh. Here, I'm going to go through these ones quick. Okay. Uh, like the, 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 you know, the, you know that, that person, but, and they go to a new one saying, God's calling me to this other place, but oftentimes it's that they just don't want to stand firm. Is this okay? Okay. I'm going to step on all y'all's toes. Okay. Uh, what, about, what about running relationship to relationship? Anytime the old relationship got difficult, you're like, whew, God's calling me to a different man. All right. Yeah. <laughs> she starts talking too much. You're like, bye, boo. All right. <laughs> Slide into somebody else's DMs. <laughs> and, uh, you, know, you, know, like, you know that person that quits, quits at work over and over and over again, and they have a million excuses, and it's, they mask it as God's calling me onto something. God's calling me onto something. But often, sometimes, sometimes running towards the Lord means standing firm and being planted where God calls you. 
moving place to place to place to place, not putting any down roots. And listen, if, 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 you, if that's ever been you, I'm not saying that that's always the case. Hear my heart, hear my heart. I'm not saying that that's always the case, but sometimes we mask, we, we, we mask faith and we, it, what it really is is flakiness. And we do it all in the name of stepping out and following God's will. And God becomes our scapegoat. And, 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 and perhaps maybe it's not faith, it's just that we're like addicted to new or it's that we're afraid of being known or we're afraid of being vulnerable or we're afraid of the call that God has on our life and actually serving. And, and, and so, and so uh, faith doesn't always cause us to go. Sometimes it's, it, it calls us to stay. He, he, God, we're, we're, we're a sending sinner. We want to send people out. So I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that people aren't going to leave, but what I'm saying is we have to, we have to ask ourselves, am I running towards the roar? Am I running towards the roar? Am I running towards the roar? See, sometimes uh, running towards the roar means staying put. And, and, and the, the, the same would be true when you have a choice, but also the same is true when you don't have a choice. Sometimes you don't have a choice in standing firm. But everything in you is telling you or everything in you is telling you to just give up or quit, but you have no choice but to stand firm. Things like sickness. You have no choice but to go to chemotherapy. Things like when people walk out on you, you have no choice over, over what other people do. And you gotta stand firm. These painful things, we can't change, we can't change what our new normal is but we can change how we view it. And we can change our perspective. And we can have our eyes opened and ask, where is Jesus in this situation? I wanna see Jesus in this situation. So we're gonna to run towards the road. Next, uh, next one is accept your mistakes and keep on moving. Accept your mistakes and keep on moving. Mistakes will be made. We're human. Hear me, you're not the first person to ever make a mistake. You're not the first person to ever mess up. You're definitely not the first person to ever sin. So why are you beating yourself up so much? Could it be that the enemy is actually using your past mistakes to stop you from running towards the roar now? No, 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 you got, you got, you got things to do. You, you, got, you, got people, you got people to save and people to heal and you got, you got to witness to people. You got, you, got, you got stuff you got to do. Don't hold yourself back because you messed up in the past. No, no, no. Actually, that thing that you did in the past that, that you always hold over your head, actually that's the thing that can be used to bring glory to God. Oh, you used to be addicted, but you got out? Tell me how you got out. Oh, oh, you messed up your first marriage? Well, tell me how you have such a good marriage now. Oh, hold on. Actually, that can be the the thing that God uses to bring him glory because if you could do it all by yourself then you wouldn't need God and you would get all the glory but maybe he's looking for some people that will say oh yeah I messed up real bad but my God is so good that he doesn't hold me at that place no, actually, he's calling me to something more. And I got to keep on moving. I got to keep on walking. I got to step into the destiny that God has for me because he has greater things for me. And he has things for me to do. And he has a purpose over my life. And I'm not going to let the enemy get me stuck in the past. Whew. I feel, the, I feel the spirit of finding Nemo in here. We got to keep on swimming, okay? You got to keep on swimming. You got to keep on swimming. Somebody say, keep on swimming. Keep on, turn the person next to you and say, keep on swimming. Turn the other person, that's choice number two, say, you really got to keep on swimming. You got to keep on going. Listen, don't get stuck. Don't put your anchor down in the past. God has things for you. There is a hope. There is a light. If you're still breathing, you have a purpose. You have a purpose. I'm not going to get stuck in the past because oftentimes what we do because we're human, we allow our past failures to paralyze us. And we stop, we stop forward movement because of something that happened in our past. See, God's not scared of what scares you. God's, God's not scared of what scares you and, and, and God's, God's not scared of your sin. He's God, and he knew you would do it, <laughs> but he still called you, and he called you out of it, 
and we can't allow that to, to be the thing that disqualifies us. Got to keep on swimming. Got to keep on going. Keep on going. You can't stop. Somebody say, can't stop. Won't stop. There it is. <laughs> you can't stop. Won't stop. All right, last one. Last one. Last one. Remember eternity. Remember eternity. See, this is how, this is how we roar. This is how we run towards the roar. We uh, reverse the fear, old things in a new way. Accept your mistakes and keep moving. And lastly, we have to remember eternity. We can't think that this life is the only thing that we'll experience. Because there's something beyond just this life. And we can't think our circumstance and situation so big that it's forever. Listen, it's the same thing with that three Hebrew boys. That fire wasn't forever. Let me tell you, the fire is not forever. That trial is not forever. And if you died, if the worst thing happened, and that thing that you're going to, through right now, and you died today, there's still eternity. Guess what? We still win. Oh, my goodness. There's still eternity. There's still eternity. See, this, this isn't our forever home. We have to keep our eyes on the prize and realize that, that, that our hope lies in the return of a king. Our hope lies in the return of a king. And, and, and this life will be over. This life, it, it'll be over before we know it. You know how, how fragile life can be. And, and John 9, 4 says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Only one life, and soon it will pass. And, and only what's done for Christ will last. We all have an eternity. We, oh, this is so good. We all have an eternity to celebrate the victories of this life. But watch this. We all have an eternity to celebrate the victories of this life, but only a few short hours to win them. We all have an eternity. We have an eternity that we're going to celebrate all of the victories of what God's done. But we only have a few short hours to win those victories right now. And I want to win victories for Christ. I want to do things for him. I want him to use me. I want him to use me and my family with, with my friends and in my workplace. I, I, I want to run towards the roar. This is how we run towards the roar. We have to keep eternity in mind and realize that there's something bigger. We've got to keep on running. We've got to keep on running. Keep on going. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm ending here, but there's a story in the Bible that we're going to look at and it's, it's such a great example of how we run towards the roar. How we run towards the roar. Y'all want to hear it? Okay, I'm doing it anyway. So <laughs> it's about to get good right here. So, so we have to remember, watch this, that we run towards the roar, but the fight is not our fight. It's not my fight. Because if the enemy is roaring at me and I'm running and I'm going towards the roar, if I try to fight it by myself, I'm going to lose. If I try to fight it in my flesh, I'm going to lose. But the fight is not ours, it's the Lord's. Watch this, 2 Chronicles 20, right here. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 15. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Come to tell somebody this morning that the battle's not yours to fight. It's just your job to run towards the roar. And he'll take care of the rest. See, the battle is not yours, but God's. Verse 16. Tomorrow, march down against them. Tomorrow, march down against them. That sounds to me like there's an enemy and they're turning towards the roar. Tomorrow, march down against them. They're not fading away. They're not running away. They're not running away from what they're scared of. They have no ability to win this fight in their own strength. But it it says, tomorrow, march down against them. Run towards the roar. 
They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position, stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. I've, I've come to tell somebody to stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord. Because the battle's not yours, it's God's. Stand firm. The Bible, Proverbs 28, 1 says, the righteous stand bold like a lion, but the wicked run when no one pursues. I don't want to run away from the battle. I want to stand firm. I want to run towards the roar. I, 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 want, to, I want to stand firm. So do not be discouraged. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. He, this, he said don't be discouraged or don't be afraid a lot. Meaning, when you run towards the roar, there will be many opportunities to be fearful. And it's okay to feel fear, but I don't want to be afraid. I can feel fear and still run towards the roar. Because uh, I know it's not my battle, it's God's. Watch this. Take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance of the Lord will give you Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Verse 18, Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshiped before the Lord. Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshiped before the Lord. Then some Levites from the other ites and the other ites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Catch this. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah, you, you already got it. See, watch this. Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshiped before the Lord. Now, Judah, Judah, you know this, you, you all in smart class, Judah means praise. And our God is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Meaning, our God is the lion of the tribe of praise. See, four people got it. When I run towards the roar, how do I do this? I said all that to say this. Great preacher quote right there. Why don't you just say that then? All right. When I run towards the roar, my God is the lion of the tribe of praise. If it's not my fight, if it's his fight, what's the key to letting the lion out of the cage? Praise. And when I begin to praise and I begin to worship, and I get, begin to, to, to fix my focus that my God is bigger than whatever enemy might be in front of me. And I realize that that, that that enemy might be big and it might be bad and it might be tougher than me. They might have more weapons than me. I don't know how I'm going to beat this. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this situation. I don't, I, don't, I don't have to know because it's not my battle. It's the Lord's. And if I'll just praise him and I'll worship him and I'll give him everything I have, I'll begin to run towards the roar. But as I'm running towards the roar, God's fighting my battle. And I let the lion out of its cage. I don't have to fight it on my own doing. I don't have to go through it by myself. I just let the lion out of the cage and let him take care of my enemies. Let him take care of my situation. Let him take care of my circumstance. Come on. I wonder if I have a few people in the place this morning that say, I'm going to run towards the roar. I'm going to let the lion out of the cage. And I'm going to let him take care of what he needs to take care of. Give them some praise right now. Come on, somebody. It says this. It says this. It says, it says, they bowed down with the face of the ground, and the people of Judah, the people of praise, fell down and worshiped before the Lord. They, they stood up and they praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice with a very loud voice with a very loud voice 
I love it right here, verse 20. Early in the morning, they left for the desert. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God and you will be upheld. He's given a, a pep talk. Have faith in the prophets and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. As they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. And as they begin to sing and as they begin to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah and they were defeated. I've come to tell somebody I've come to tell somebody that when you fix your focus and you begin to give praise to God like he deserves it, that it will unlock the cage and he'll start taking care of what you think is taking care of you. He'll start when I start to worship more and worry less and run towards the roar, I can fulfill all that God has for me. I can't preach with more passion than that. I wonder if we could praise and we can worship and we can run towards the roar with everything we have. Come on, let's go. Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's 